Hey everyone, welcome to the Mother Days podcast. I am one of two hosts, Teresa Palmer. And I am the other one, Sarah Wright Olson. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. Sometimes we dance, don't we, at the start? We Sometimes do. we just we do get, a little dance. I mean, the intro song, not that we get to hear it when we're recording, guys, but we do enjoy our intro song. It kind of sounds like a little country gym jam around the campfire. So yes. uh, I always imagine it in my picture. hand. I know, me too. Me too. I always do and I dance. Do you know, it's a really catchy song and people have told me that they like how different it is for a parenting podcast. Like It's kind of cool. It's vibey. You're right. It's like that campfire or hanging out with the crew. It's fun. So fun. Um, Okay, you guys, we are so pumped today because we have another one of our favorite recordings to do. This is going to be Teresa's fourth birth story. Before we get started, some crazy stuff went down today. So Teresa, you got to lay it all out for us. <laughs> yeah, guys, Um, this is what Eric would describe as the pivot. <laughs> I, I am like, I am deep in a pivot. I have, I've swiveled right around. Well, let's just say that how, how many days ago did you get to America? Oh my God. It, it actually is giving me goosebumps to think about. So it is Friday <laughs> here. Mm-hmm. And um, we landed Tuesday night. So okay. me, my husband, all the kids, we landed Tuesday night. We drove straight to Frankie's house. Now, Frankie, for those who don't know, Frankie is the mother of my stepson, Isaac. So we are all one big happy blended family living under the one roof right now. <laughs> and me, Mark, and the kids, you should see the setup. It's really funny. We're all sleeping in one room, like a TV room, but it's not that big. So we've got like all the kids spaced out on the couch. Then there's one single tempur mattress on the ground that had like me and three children on last night because everyone wanted to sleep in my arms. And then Mark on this blow up thing. Anyway, it's hilarious. But suitcases everywhere. We finally settle in. We're ready to be in America for the next like four or five months. And then I get a call yesterday. Being like, hey, there's this opportunity. Like, why don't you chuck yourself down on tape? But we need it by tomorrow morning. Which for me, (laughs) when you have that many kids and you don't have a nanny and it's just chaotic, like I can't just make a tape in three hours notice. Yeah, that's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Like I like to have a good five days of prep, learning the lines. Anyway, it was such a cluster F that... I ended up doing it at nighttime with a ring light once the kids were in bed with Mark and I made him do it a gazillion times until I was happy. And then I got a call this morning saying I got this job and I am getting picked up in one hour to go to the airport. So That is insane. <laughs> it's insane. insane. I've never had a turnaround like that before. <laughs> never, ever. It is. I just feel completely out of my body and I was just saying to Sarah like to think that you have just the next few months like with your family you're all together I have plans on Sunday I'm going to Sarah's book launch next week Uh, there's so much that I was excited about and anticipating all of a sudden I get this job and I'm on a plane the next day right back to Australia where I came from (laughs) <laughs> and I've just got over jet lag. It's wild, but it's a really exciting project. It's a big film, lots of people who I admire in the film industry. So I know I have to do it, but I'm also like I've been battling all these feelings of these like self-limiting, just these limiting beliefs and self-doubt. And um, I am i don't do comedy that often and this is a comedic role and I was like Sarah you need to help me because <laughs> I'm feeling out of my body and she's the comedic actress of the two of us and I'm like I don't even I, like what did I even do I can't even believe I got this and now I'm nervous about the role no. but I'm also so sad I'm so sad because I the boys can't come with me they're starting oh. school on Monday and 
I the longest I've ever been away from the boys is 48 hours. That's the longest I've ever been away. And this is going to be 10 days and I just I feel so sick about it. And I I don't even know, but they don't want to come. I also asked them. I was like, <laughs> "How cool would it be? We could just get back on the plane and we can all go down. It'll be a fun adventure in Australia." And they were like, "No, we did. We were just in Australia. We're staying here. We're going to our new school." They're like, "Yeah, no way." They're like, "They know they're going to be able to watch hours of iPad with Dad. They're going to have oh, party 100%. time." <laughs> it's like, oh god. So I'm moving through feelings right now. Yeah. No, it's it's a lot. And I mean, that is first of all, I I just got to break this down for one second because. The first part of this hustle is the fact that you had only like four hours to put yourself on tape and then get get it to your team or whatever by the next morning, mm-hmm. right? And I mean, the window of time when you actually had daylight, because it's not like you have like a lighting kit at your house. No. <laughs> um, daylight to be able to like do it and put yourself on tape. And then the second part of this is like now you have now everything that you just came back here and you're like, all right, I'm back. Yes. And you're se- mm-hmm. settling in. And now you got to reroute yourself all the way back to Australia. So I know that it sounds and feels crazy, but I was telling yeah. Tess this morning when she wrote me, I was like, I remembered reading this somewhere. I don't know where it was. Maybe it was on, you know, SAG after it has these amazing little interviews that they do with great actors and some someone on one of those said um, when they were presented with this role and they were like, I don't know, they were having this self doubt and they were like, like, like I don't know, if I don't know if I can do that and be opposite that actor and like all of those things. Mm-hmm. And then and then someone said to them, Why not you? Oh my god! Because if it's not you, it's gonna be somebody else. Like why not? Uh, you're actually gonna make me cry. That is so sweet. That was the thing that I needed this morning from you. She said that she was like, Why not you? like oh my god (laughs) it is but it is like of course like the whole universe just moved its way and to make this happen for you and it all and by the way this is exactly what we're talking about in the manifesting episode right it's like the universe puts something in front of you it dangles it there and it says yeah this is hard if you don't make this happen this is your fear this is your thing that's like you know getting in your way but instead you said okay yes I'm gonna try to do that oh it would be so insane to do that okay I'm gonna go for it and then boom it happens and mm-hmm. now it's like whoa it really happened oh my gosh. like you took the step and then you made that happen it's a huge thing and why not you I mean you're Aww. amazing you're so sweet. It was I have read that text this morning over and over because I <laughs> I've like all these feelings have been coming in waves. Like, I'm so excited. It's such a big opportunity. I'm like, oh my God, the actors I'm working with, oh my God, I am unworthy. No, you are worthy. And then like I would read this. I'm like, Sarah believes in me and and oh, yeah. why not me? And it like we said with the wobbly voice, but still said, it's still said. That's right. And um That's right. you know, the the emotions have been so intense today because I've been so excited. Oh, but yes. I just but I keep looking at the boys and I'm like, and I know it's me. I know it's me missing them. That's right. Or re- like looking at them and just not being around <laughs> them and not hearing their little and I know I'll be FaceTiming a gazillion times. And the boys are so unfazed and so unaffected. Yeah. I'm like, yes. wait, I, won't you miss me? Um, but it's fine. <laughs> They're like just stoked to be back and stoked to be living here with Isaac. And oh. they're, you know, they we call them Auntie Frankie and uh, um, Uncle Zach. That's um, that's mm-hmm. Frankie's husband. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, we're all big one happy family and the kids are feeling really happy here. So I'm letting go of my own feelings surrounding it and I'm just leaning yes. into this opportunity. And even though it feels scary, it's um, really incredibly exciting. So it's gonna anyway, be that's great. been my day. And I <laughs> we recorded another podcast today and um, you'll hear that soon, before, after. We're not sure, but we're it was not about sure. breastfeeding. <laughs> We're not exactly <laughs> sure, um, but I felt out of my body. Like I was having yeah. an out-of-body experience and I kept thinking, oh, my God, I'm messing this episode up no. because I'm not like in my body properly. I'm just in my head so much. But now I feel like I've landed firmly back in my feet and I hope that That's we can right. make this a great episode. And as soon as this episode's over, she has 15 minutes to pack and then she has to get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> 
crazy. Oh my god. If you want to know what chaos sounds like, yeah, sometimes your amazing dream that you're hoping for is going to come true, but the universe is also going to laugh at you at the same time and be like, "Okay, make it happen. We're going to make this hard. We're going to make it hard." Oh my goodness. Okay. Right. Well, uh, speaking speaking of dreams, um Dreams. My dream baby girl, Prairie. Um, uh, I'm the only one doing a fourth birth story, but that <laughs> might not be for long. <laughs> November, no, I'm not remember? pregnant yet, everybody. November, maybe next. But it, maybe next November. Wait, I currently isn't it? still have an IUD in. So, oh, okay. Come on, Sarah. You've got look. You've got two and a half weeks of November. Although I'm not. I have heard stories, and feel free to DM us your stories. But I have heard heard stories that sometimes they can get past the IUD and a little yes. miracle baby can be in there. So, well, we never know. Never know. I've heard of like them coming out with it. Is it an IUD, the little stick? It's like a, it's like a copper cup. I don't know. It's kind of, no, no, no. It's little. It's really tiny, but it's copper. And I mm-hmm. don't remember what it looks like. Um, I but guess I've I should. babies. But- coming out there coming are out with photo, it ho- with it on its head or they're holding the little stick there's actually some really funny That's photos out hysterical there. <laughs> i think that would Hilarious. give me a lot of anxiety of like is that gonna <laughs> like do something weird <laughs> to hurt baby. them in any way yeah I know. like this was I know. supposed to cancel this from happening but it's now my baby's coming out holding it being like ha ha i showed oh, you <laughs> i got i got past it he 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 i'm the one percent right. all right so prairie moon palmer uh, tell us the story i want to hear all the things like were you trying to get pregnant with your fourth no, baby as you know sarah yes. um because i sent her a message <laughs> being like oh my effing god i actually got a full <laughs> video <laughs> Yeah. So, so oh my um, gosh you should put the video up you oh should my put god, the video I should. up <gasps> i know uh, i would definitely do the video it's, i was fully crying when oh i was my watching god. it okay it was so i'll let you funny. tell the story So in August 2020, I was in uh, Kangaroo Island. I was staying at this beautiful place. I was shooting something for the South Australian Tourism Commission. And I just had this feeling, I think Poet was about 15 months old, April, May, June, July, August. She was 14 months old, 15 months old. And I was like, oh, I would just love to have another daughter. I would love to give poet a baby sister that would be amazing I always wanted to have little sisters and um how incredible would that be like I'm not quite ready yet but I'm just gonna put it out there so that that day on the beach in August 2020 I wrote out really big on the sand the name Prairie because I knew if I was to have a girl it was gonna be Prairie yes I was an OA fan and the main character's name is Prairie. I used to watch Little House on the Prairie with my nana. So I was like, that's the name. Put Prairie out there, took a photo of it, didn't think anything of it, then um, then went about my merry way. So we were in Wales. I was with my girlfriend, Susie. Uh, my husband was sort of coming in and out sporadically because Isaac obviously lives in America, my stepson, and he was shooting something at the time too. So we had done some shebanging, um, but only, but only one. It was, it was, <laughs> we were not in a regular stage at that time. And it was once, it was about day eight of my cycle. Uh, I think I had just stopped bleeding from my period. We had one little shebang, and then the very next day he was on a plane back to America. (laughs) So as you can imagine, day eight, I'm someone who is a late ovulator. I tend to ovulate around like day 18. Um, So we thought we were doing rhythm method and we thought day eight was incredibly safe. I guess little Miss Prairie really wanted to come in. Um, So... (laughs) She was such a surprise. We had no idea I could possibly be pregnant. Um, And then I missed my period. And I was like, no, that's weird. Like, oh, maybe it's because I've been working out a lot. 
went to like the janky ass toilets in the Tesco supermarket <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm just going to like pee on this just so I can rule that out because it's I had it in the back of my mind. Like, is there any way? I was like, there's just no way. It wasn't even close to ovulation. I was there with um, Susie who's been on our podcast before. Yes. And um, I peed and immediately like just a dark second line was up and I was like, oh, my God, my whole body went into shock. I've never felt such shock before like that. And everything <sighs> felt, I just started, sh- my hands just started shaking. I started crying. I was like, uh, 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 uh. it was just such, a, I just, I could not believe it. I could not believe it. I was showing Susie. I was like, oh, I didn't even, I, I didn't even expect this. I did. I like, we weren't at all trying. I was going to do this <laughs> next year. Like, whoa. Um, but it's so funny. It was just the like divine timing. That was when I was meant to have this little baby. And funnily enough, I did the calculations and she was due two years, four months after Poet. And Poet and Forest are two years, four months apart. So I'm like, that's Look, crazy. This, this just must be when my body wants to get pregnant. Um, yeah. Anyway, so had a very uneventful pregnancy. Obviously, telling Mark that I was pregnant was hilarious. Um, he didn't believe it. We both were like what? Um, and then we uh, we found out it was a girl that was like the most amazing, exciting. And when we were pregnant, um, before we found out it was a girl, I went and did like as early as possible blood tests to find out the gender, like eight and a half weeks um, because I'm just one of those people who I just have to know. Um, Mark, Mark was like, you know, this is a girl. This is a girl. And I was like, you know what? I think because of the f- way she's come in and how we weren't actively yeah. trying – I think this is our little prairie. And we found out that she was due almost exactly a year to the day that I took that photo on the beach of her name, which was unbelievable. My gosh. That's insane. I know. I was like, what is that? Wow. Um, So, yeah, I had a really beautiful pregnancy. It was uneventful apart from my ISO immunization pregnancy, which I bang on about every single birth story but um it's just she had to be monitored a little bit more and everything was looking fine I would say halfway through when you have a um, sensitized pregnancy you have to get what's called your titers tested to make sure that your body isn't fighting off the baby too much so if I have antibodies they want to know what level these antibodies are because if they get too high, that means my body's really attacking the baby. So um, it was very uneventful Mm -hmm. and then I would say halfway through my titers started rising. So people started getting a little bit more nervous. Um, It wasn't at a critical level but it meant that my body was really kicking in to start sort of attacking the blood of my baby which can make the baby Mm -hmm. anemic. So I then was having a lot more scans and a lot more uh, blood tests than usual, I would say. And our beautiful Dr. Goldberg, who we talk about all the time, he really held me through this process when I was in America. He knew a lot about it, even though he said he had only had three or four patients in the past who had gone through something like this. Yeah, He was just someone that I could lean on whenever fear came up. Um, I was shooting a movie in Estonia and I went to a local doctor there and the doctor really freaked me out and was like, this isn't normal. There's an issue with the placenta. And just so much started, so much fear was in my body that I just had to move through. And he was a really wonderful um, support system for me. Yeah. I got to the end of my pregnancy and I was planning on having a uh, midwife-led birth with Julie Schiller, my go-to midwife who also contributed to our book. Um, However, it was in the middle of COVID. So whilst things had shifted somewhat, uh, it was definitely not as intense as when Sarah gave birth to Winter. Um, There were some restrictions. So one of the restrictions meant you could only have your husband in the birth suite. 
And I'm so, you you listened to the last birth, my third birth. I love being supported and held by a sisterhood. So I was like, oh, that's really not going to work for me. I don't know. I want the kids there. I want them to experience it. You know, Bodhi is at the age, he was seven when Prairie was born. He was at the age where he would just really enjoy that experience. It would be impactful. So I had to kind of pivot using that word again, into um, <laughs> a different, uh, just a, a different idea of what my birth could look like. And I kind of went mm. back to where I started on this birthing journey way back in 2014. And I was intrigued about the idea of a home birth because I knew at a home birth, even though there were restrictions on how many people could be at the house, I knew I could have 10. And that meant great, that's my mom, that's basically all my children because I have so many of them, um, <laughs> but also my birth photographer and Cass who works for us at Your Zen Mama. Cass was there and just um, all my girlfriends to help me. I had um, Kat again as my doula. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. It's my fourth baby even though I was nervous about doing a home birth with the middle two, I feel like I've done it enough now. Julie will be at the home birth. Um, and so we decided to rent a house close to the hospital because my house is about 35 minutes away and we actually weren't able to do a home birth from my house because you have to be within 30 minutes of a hospital. So we Airbnb'd a house. We did not tell them <laughs> that we were going to be birthing at their house. We said we wanted to be oh, closer to the hospital. <laughs> and so it was really funny when I put the birth pictures out there, we had to crop all of their paintings out to make it look like just this oh generic room. Because I was like, what if we get caught? <laughs> what if they find out we birthed in their house? Like, would anybody care? I don't know, but maybe they would. Maybe for insurance yeah, reasons maybe. or if something went wrong. I don't know. Mm, that's but true. But there's a really funny video of... Cat, my bestie, um, emptying the birth pool with this big, it's like a huge hose. And she was doing it all over their grass, like all the poo, <laughs> all the blood, all the, just all over their back lawn. And she was like, how funny, because their lawn probably grew really beautifully. I was going to say, I bet it was the <laughs> best fertilizer that's like ever, ever happened. <laughs> ever, which is so funny. Um, anyway, oh so gosh. we agreed to have a home birth. It was beautiful. And it was, we just decided, you know what? Done. This is what we're going to do. So it got to about 30 eight weeks, I was being monitored and um, I was about 38 plus six. I did a couple of stretch and sweeps and it wasn't really moving anything. And with isoimmunization babies, as I said in my last birth, they like them to come by their due date, if not mm -hmm. a week earlier. So I'm running, I'm bouncing, I'm doing everything. I'm hiking, I'm so much exercise. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I don't like to have regrets in birth at all, um, However, I will say if I could go back, I would not have focused as much on the exercise um, component of it to bring the baby out. I was so focused on that <laughs> that I didn't focus enough on turning baby into the optimal birthing position. Mm. So for me, my babies like to lie posterior, but I'm able to do spinning babies and turn them anterior. And I really focused on that with the middle two kids. But with this bub, I was like, oh, whatever, posterior. I'm sure she'll turn. It'll be fine. I did it a little bit here and there, but I really did not commit to it at all. I was so much more focused on getting the baby out by 39 weeks or 40 weeks that I just didn't do any of those exercises and I paid for it. So yeah, that was one of the things that if I could go back, I would have focused a little bit more on her positioning. I did acupuncture. I did all the things to get her moving and it worked. Um, at 38 plus six, Mark and I had a little shebang. Um, as you know, it's one of the things <laughs> <laughs> that helps get That's the baby what moving. To do. <laughs> That's what you do. They say it's something in the sperm. Like loosens and softens and ripens. Ripens yeah. the cervix. <laughs> the cervix. Sounds gross, but. I know it does. It sounds really <laughs> feral. Anyway, um, I thought my water broke again, which is what happened with Bodhi. And I was like, I think this could be 
potentially be my water. I texted um, my midwife, Julie, in the morning. So I think I was like 38 plus six that because she was born on 39. So it was the day before. And um, I was like, I think it happened. I think there's something coming out and I'm pretty sure I didn't pee myself. So I came in to get checked. She checked me and she was like, you have a slow leak. It's not a big gush, but it, and so she was like, run, do whatever you can do to like get it sort of gushing a bit more and then labor's going to start. So that's what I did. Um, we, we left the birth center. She was like, I'll see you later today. We were really excited. We went down to, um, Glenelg beach, which was near the house where, uh, that we rented. And Mark's like, all right, up and down those stairs, go. So I was like up and down the stairs. I did it about 30 times <laughs> and I could feel these little contractions coming in. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's working. Here, here we go. And they were probably like a three out of 10 intensity. Um, yeah, yeah. And Mark's like, all right, we've got to just keep walking. So we walked up and down the beach, like up sand dunes down again like walking along the jetty the sun was setting it was so pretty we just kept going and kept going and they were somewhat regular they would come like every seven minutes every three minutes every 15 minutes and it was kind of this funny but it did remind me of my padromal labor that I had in the Mm. other pregnancies but the problem with this was that now my water had broken I was going to be against the clock again. And I knew with Bodhi's birth that that didn't end up so great for me that I could feel the fear start rising when the contractions petered out. I was like, I cannot Mm. afford to have these contractions peter out like this. I need to keep the momentum of these contractions. What can we do? Mark was like, please don't tire yourself out. You've got a long night ahead of you. Let's go back to the house. Let's just make dinner for the kids. Let's calm down. We watched this really funny Paris Hilton cooking show and it was amazing. <laughs> like I actually messaged her afterwards after I gave birth and I was like, you're a big part of my birth story <laughs> because I watched episode after episode after episode. Did she message you back? <laughs> Um, I got love hearts back. Um, (laughs) All right. Well, that's something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I um, I was – Mark put the kids to bed and I I was excited. I was saying to them like, guys, we're going to wake you up. We're going to wake you up in the middle of the night. The baby's going to be here. My mum went to bed and then um, nothing then nothing. <laughs> I'm watching this show. I'm like rolling around on the birth ball. Yeah. Like, What's going on? Like laughing at this show because it's really funny. Having a great time with Mark, but I'm watching the clock and I'm like, oh my God, what is going on? They've, they've gone. They've yeah. completely gone. So Mark was like, babe, I think you're getting in your own way. Mm. I think you just need to stop because I was obsessively like timing them all timing. being like yes oh my gosh this one was okay. only three minutes okay. uh, yeah and I'm right. giving updates to my birth team and my midwife and she was like don't worry about it don't worry about it try and get some sleep um and the night before I didn't sleep at all so I was so excited which is hilarious if you go back and listen to my first birth story There's lots of similarities. I did the same thing. I was too excited. I didn't sleep that night. And I, so I was now going into my second night and I knew I had to sleep because I hadn't slept at all the night before. And I was like, right, I'm going to try and get some rest. And I went to bed about 11 and they were sort of coming a little bit, but they just weren't, there was nothing strong about them. And so I ended up, deciding I couldn't sleep. I was just too wired. I was keeping my midwife updated. I was like, I'm getting in the bath. I'm just going to go and get in the bath. I'm going to relax. I had a little bit of sleep in the bath. And then I kind of woke up around, I would say 1230. And I was like, oh, that felt Mm. different. Hang on a second. Cool. Like got Mark was like, babe, babe, I think this feels different. This one felt pinchy, like a real pinch to it. Um, and then it was kind of on at that point. So 
I was walking around. I had my whole birth area set up. I had the candles on. I put the music on and everyone was asleep. So the house was dead quiet and it was just Mark and I with music and I started sort of rolling around and I was like, wow, these feel, okay, this feels pretty strong pretty quickly. And I would say after about 45 minutes, um, the sensation changed from the front of my tummy to my back. And I was like, oh, God, this is, this is the posterior baby. She's still posterior. It didn't, nothing. Nothing changed. She, I thought miraculously she might just flip herself back around again because I've been told yeah. by Dr. Um, Goldberg that my womb is very roomy. <laughs> that it, there's like a lot of space and stuff. And so I was like, oh, she's got plenty of room. She'll just like flip around to be in the good birthing position. Didn't happen. So I was like, oh, God, these are really, these feel a lot harder to manage than my previous two births. So I ended up getting in the shower and I remember Kat arriving, my doula bestie, and um, she was like, that's beautiful, Tess, just keep going. And it was such a different labor for me. It was so different from anything I had previously experienced that I was taken aback and I could feel, maybe also because I was so tired as well, I could feel so much more fear in this birth. And I don't know if it has anything to, I know the back labor made me feel fearful because I remember how hard that was to navigate. But I also have reflected back and and I've thought, was it because I was at, at home and not And it wasn't my home either. It was a rented home. It wasn't like my regular space that I'm used to. I'm at this rented home, not in the hospital, not in the birthing suite that I'm used to. Is that why I felt a little less mentally prepared? Even though I thought I was Mm. there, I was like, oh, I got this, I got this. But I can um, really remember it being in the shower, because I love being in the shower. I always talk about that. And the hot water was pounding. I had it so boiling hot, um, pounding my lower back. And it was the only thing that was helping. And the rolling around, the movement wasn't even really giving me much relief. And my um, and Cassandra turned up, who works for your Zen Mama, works for Mother Day. She's one of our very good friends. Her and her hubby turned up because her husband, Stu, is this amazing photographer and he's never been at a birth before. They, they haven't got kids. <laughs> um, and she tells this funny story about how he they got out, he was grabbing his stuff from the back, he was packing together his, his camera bag and they could hear me from the street outside being like, <laughs> like so loud. And oh he like grabbed the scruff of his neck and pretended to sort of like pull himself back into the car to be like, peace, I'm out of here. Like, He's I like, I'm out, this. I can't. This yeah. is way too vulnerable for me. Cassandra was like, no, buddy, you have come way too far. <laughs> Get on in there. Uh, and he was so, do- I could see like in his face when he first, got there I was like whoa he's really confronted by this but he was so divine he just sort of quietly put together his camera and then just started snapping photos of me and he got the most incredibly vulnerable photos of me he really did oh my goodness the photos in the shower I was really having a hard time and I I kept grabbing Mark and I'm like, this is so intense. This is so hard. Oh, my goodness. And Mark's like, reframe, reframe. I was trying all my things. I was like, ah, thinking, trying to do all the light size, like the, "Ah, yes, yes. But every time it would reach the the peak, my back felt like it was snapping. Um, And I could tell that my midwife, she came in to check on me and and I was getting louder and loud like a lion, like a really loud, roaring person. And I was just like, this isn't 
working for me. I need, I need to switch things up. So she was like, come into the birth pool. It's time. Oh, like, so they sort of God. walked me over to the birth pool. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't, I knew that I wasn't there yet. I wasn't ready to mm-hmm. push or anything. I wasn't even close. It didn't feel like I was close. Um, and this was, it had labor started, I'd say around 12, 30 ish, but it really kind of kicked in around 2.30. I'd say 2.30 was when it was like full active, roaring through Mm. every single contraction, just kind of feeling miserable in between as well. Like I would just go there. It'd be so big and I felt so out of my body. But in between I was, even though I was kind of talking to my friends and like laughing, it was so meek, this little meek, like, oh. I had no energy. I was so exhausted because I hadn't slept the night before. And I was just like, yeah, like it was, it was really quite different from my birth with Poet where it was just this ecstatic feeling. I was like just getting through it. I felt like I was going through the ringer. Um, mm. And it just went and went and went. And then as I was in the water, I was moving and pooping and Mark was doing the little pooper scooper and he was getting out all the little poops and everyone was beautiful like Cassandra was bringing me these cold flannels and putting them on my head and um Cass was um Kat was doing a light touch massage on me and like they were they were playing with my hair and they were just loving me and holding me up and I could see Stu and I just thought he was being so gorgeous the way he was capturing it and Um, but everyone was still asleep. So I am roaring so loudly and the whole rest of the house is dead asleep. All my kids are asleep. My mum's, I can hear my mum snoring from down the hall. (laughs) While you're doing, making all these sounds, like everyone, uh, loudest. I don't think, I've never been this loud in birth and it was, and the one thing that helped, and I reckon I was about eight centimeters at this point, I was just like, mm. oh, like so loud. My midwife, Julie, came and she grabbed onto my hips. Do you remember how someone did that to yes. you in your birth? Yes. That Was yes. it Dr. Berlin that was holding your hips in a certain way? Yeah, it was Dr. B. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with the bait with um, my 11 pound baby because. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it just felt like I could not get that. I couldn't get um, enough like room. It couldn't separate oh. enough or something as she was trying to come down. So he was doing counter pressure and like deep, deep, deep massage on the side. And it was oh. helping so much. Wow. Okay. Well, Julie did this thing where she grabbed my hips and she like drove her thumbs into my lower back and sort of pulled yes. my hips back at the peak of the contraction. And I was like, oh my God, that is amazing. That feels like it's taking away from the intensity in my back. And now I look look at it and I was like, oh my God, I had a TENS machine right there. I totally could have used it. And I just, I've never, I always hire them and I've never used it. And at the peak of those contractions, I was, I really felt like I was suffering through them. Um, And I started feeling afraid. I'd gone through this period where I was like, I'm just a lioness. Like, I'm getting through it. And um, I suddenly started thinking, wait, these are so strong and so powerful. Why am I not pushing? The same thing that happened in Poet's Birth. I was like, I'm not pushing yet. Like, am I close? Am I close? What's going on? So Julie's like, Teresa, I think that you're so in your head about having a cervical lip that I think yeah. we need to get you out. Let's get out of the water and let's check the lip. And I was like, I've got, I've definitely got a lip. Like, oh, this is so intense. <laughs> like, oh my God, the lip, the lip's holding me back. And then she, she went up there, she checked and she was like, there's no lip. There's no lip. You're right there. You're right there. She's just not in 
the optimal position. Optimal position, yeah. She was like, what you need to do is you're working so much harder than you're used to to bring her down. Oh, yeah. You've got to shake and grind and move your hips. Oh, my gosh. And- my sh- my hip shakes. My, yes. my, drum, my drum beat hip shakes because that, like, moving, the baby's dancing like off to the wrong side. side. Yes. yes. Oh, totally. So I was like moving and grinding and just, uh, and I had these two huge contractions where I was like, I can literally feel it right now. Oh. <gasps> Like I was yelling like nobody's business. I cannot believe the cops didn't get called. I was like, oh, oh my like, god! I've never been louder. I didn't even know I had that sort of noise potential in me. Um, and then, by the way, the kids were still fast asleep. This was about 6.15 and I was like, mm. oh, I, I could feel it. And I, <laughs> but I felt her, I felt something change because I'd been stuck in that for a full hour, I'd been stuck in that like grinding, moving, trying to bring her down and knowing that she just wasn't in the right position. I'd been stuck there for a full hour and I was bloody exhausted. There is this amazing photo hard. that Stuart took of me where I just, you've never seen more despair. I was like, oh, I'm looking down the lens of the camera. I don't even remember this. And it was in between oh. a contraction and I was just so spent and I just <laughs> could not. I'm like, how am I going to oh get gosh. through this? Um, but then after those two really crazy, loud, powerful ones, I could feel, I felt her move down and I put my hand up and I was like, oh, oh my God, oh my God, I can feel her. And I suddenly wow. got so excited and everything just shifted. They were like, yes, you're there, you've done it that was so hard she's right there so the sun was coming up and there was this really beautiful hue to the room and I was feeling so elated I knew I was right at the end so Cassandra ran down and woke everyone up and they all came out Kat was holding Forrest and Cassandra was holding Poet and Poet had this sleepy headed hair and she was like, yay, mummy, mummy. She was only two years, four months. <laughs> she was like, yay, mummy, go, mummy, baby Perry coming, baby Perry. And I was like, yes, baby Aww. Perry's almost here. And then Bodhi was like, mum, you're my champion. You're my hero. You're so amazing. You got this, mum. And then Forrest was clapping and yelling and everyone, there was just this injection of, energy and excitement and it was exactly what I needed it the kids Uh, I've never seen them so excited and so engaged uh, and they sat by the pool and Bodhi held my hand and I was roaring and I explained to them guys mummy is a lioness I'm a lioness (laughs) right now and I'm roaring so big and I was like you wait you've never heard mummy this loud before okay it's gonna be really loud and my mum was all there like so excited and they were there for the last 15 minutes of the birth which was perfect actually and I just kind of roared her out a couple more times and then I felt the head move right there And um, I did my favorite breathing, as I always do, my (laughs) panting and my horsey lips. And I just sort of eased her little head out. And when I say little head, I mean little teeny tiny head. Um, She, although she felt like an 11-pound whopper, she was not. (laughs) Um, How big was she? (laughs) She was six pound, seven ounces this teeny little floppy thing so she I kind of breathed her out and she came through and instead of pulling her up fast out of the water I really let her gently kind of float up and out of the water it was so peaceful and she looked up at me and she had those big palmer eyes which three of four of my kids oh, have yeah I was like there yes. you are there you are little <laughs> magic moon um and we've always called her our little magic moon because oh. the way she came in we think she's so magical and she we first saw her heart beat on the full moon and there were so many things that happened in the pregnancy um to do with the moon and her that that's why we decided 
um, that that would be her middle name. But she came up and she looked at me with these big eyes and I just was so elated. I was so happy it was over. I just could not believe how challenging that was. It was my second most challenging physically birth that I have experienced. Um, And I was just so joyful. I don't think I've ever been so tired though. I was (laughs) so physically wrecked. It was almost... I would almost say it was physically harder than Bodhi's birth. Um, Mm. The intensity level was so extreme for Mm. some reason. And and she's so funny because she came out so teeny and tiny and I we got out of the birth pool and I sat on the birth stool. And this is the first time I've ever done this. I birthed the placenta on the birth stool. Oh, whoa. And it felt really supported and great. Um, it was wonderful. I put a, They put a puppy pee pad under me and so I birthed oh. that way. But I didn't want to birth the placenta. I actually was like, no, no, I just don't, don't want to do this part because I was so tired. I was so tired. On their couch. And the couch, because we were in this Airbnb, was covered with a tarp and so many different things to make sure there was no blood anywhere. Um, mm. I, I, <laughs> felt, I was like asleep with this new baby. I was so beyond exhausted. I could barely even talk to anyone. And they're like, you know that you haven't done the placenta yet and I was like oh my god do I have to do I actually have to do this part and they were Mm. like yes (laughs) you got here pass the baby off and now you do have to push the placenta out but it's so much easier than pushing a baby out that it was fine I just didn't have any contractions so I had to manually push it out and um I've just never in my life actually felt so physically depleted um Mm. And she, what ended up happening was we were all snuggling with her and she was doing so well. But then Julie took her temperature and she just couldn't get warm enough. So we covered her in blankets and wrapped her up and she was so itty bitty um, that Julie was like, I just want to see her a little bit warmer than what she is. And she's she's not, we had the heater cranked, everything. She was like, I just I want to make sure she's totally fine. So let me ring the hospital and we'll go in. And I was like, oh my God. The last thing I felt like doing, obviously, was going into the hospital because I was so exhausted. I just wanted to be with my little bub bubs. Um, But I was worried. I was worried. Why is she cold? Um, And I, I actually took a glimpse of my placenta and I've never had this on a placenta before. With Poa, I had some calcification. But this looked really different. So my placenta was very small, very small. And I was like, oh, is that why she's such a small baby? But there was a whole chunk of it. I would say the size of a fist that was a fatty deposit, just this Oh, my gosh. White. Think of like fat on a piece of bacon. It was oh, just wow. this whole massive fatty chunk. And the two midwives that were there, the backup midwife, and Julie, both of them are like, we've never, ever, ever, ever seen this before. We don't know what it Whoa. is. Whoa. I know. And she brought it into the hospital to have them look at it. And did they find anything out? No. No one knows what it was. No one knows Whoa. what it was. And in my head, I'm like, is that why she was so small? And even though that's not that small, I mean, lots of people are probably listening to this being like, oh, six pounds, seven, that's not that small. But for me, she came at 39 weeks like on the dot. Yeah. But for mm-hmm. me, I had a, a 38 plus 6 baby who was 8 pounds. Right. And my smallest baby before Prairie was 7 pound 8, which was Poet. And um, and then Forrest was 8 pound 4. So she she seemed so little to me. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we, we ended up going to the hospital. We were there just for the day because um, she was born right at 6.30 in the morning. And we were there until about two o'clock and they just wanted her temperature to rise. So like every hour what they did, would they'd turn the humidity crib down so that she could maintain a temperature. So each hour they'd turn it down a degree. So it was a step-by-step process to make sure that her body was 
at the right temperature. And I was so exhausted. I actually just fell asleep uh, in the hospital room with her curled up on the chair. Like, and I was really shaky and just so tired. Um, but I think they could see how exhausted I was. I was like, I literally gave birth like a couple of hours ago and I'm here in the hospital with my baby. And I, it's not like I could hold her either because she was in the humidity crib sleeping on her belly. Um, And so Mark was like, go into the parents room and just crash out on the couch. And when she needs to breastfeed, I'll come and get you. So he was really beautiful and loving and um, but we left, yeah, I think around 2.30 p.m. We left to go back and then I slept so beautifully <laughs> that night and and it was just oh, amazing seeing the kids with her and how happy they were. And so we stayed at that Airbnb for three nights all settling in and then we moved to our home and that was that. Oh, my gosh. that I didn't know parts of that story. That is wild. Yeah. Um, the part, I mean – when you have a home birth and then you feel like you need to transfer um, afterwards or you end up having to go to the hospital, which is like, you know, something you were trying to avoid just to have your baby at home. Mm -hmm. That's really because we had a very similar thing happen um, in our situation when we gave birth to Wyatt um, two days after uh, I gave birth to him, he got a fever and then we had to go to the hospital. And so I I was still in that very like new, you know, just had a baby, still feeling all the feels and then being like, wait, what? Wait, what? We have to go to the hospital? There could be something wrong? Like I was just so at a loss and still Mm. feeling depleted and everything. But anyway, that is such an amazing birth story though. And wow, like how you had to become this lioness who was Mm -hmm. pushing this baby down. And I feel like you had so many like, moments in this birth that not only have you had to learn from other births, but there were also new learning lessons in this birth. Absolutely. They were so different. So different. So different. And I remember during this labor, I was like, I'm never, ever, ever doing this again. I can't do this again. (laughs) This is so insane. This is so insane. And I was like, it's so funny because I have like all these dreamy births, like especially my middle two births. Yeah. So dreamy. And I was like, oh my gosh, it wasn't even that hard. And then (laughs) then with this one, I was like, holy St. Francis. Oh my God. Like I just. Yeah. And it's for me, it's all about positioning. Next time. Yeah next time hopefully there's a next time (laughs) I will this will be my main focus will be ensuring that that baby is anterior yeah Yeah, because it makes all the difference so if you're listening and you get told you have a posterior baby and you're like I'm really keen on a natural birth amazing you can do it you can get through it but try 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 to get that baby anterior before labor and even if it doesn't work out you still got this mama you still got this you can do it um and there are just you yeah. know there are certain things like that counter pressure that's really helpful water and then uh, or becoming a lioness in a forest which is i <laughs> actually visualized i pictured the the face of a lion of a lioness and yeah. i was like oh. yeah like I was just picturing her in the jungle. <laughs> I bet that helped you so much. I mean, that it actually, did. you know, with my birth, so many of these moments that you were describing was like taking me back to the birth with Wyatt because mm. um, when my midwife had checked me a few times, like my Wyatt was actually more turned to the side, like over on the right. So when he came down, he came down in like a very weird position and it was somewhere in between like, the optimal position and then the, you know, all the way turned around. So um, I I think that's why it took me so long to get him down. It took me so long to, to push. There was those four hours because of that positioning. And so I was, you know, definitely doing a million cat cows when I was oh. pregnant with Esme to try to make sure that that didn't happen again. <laughs> but um, that oh my was, goodness. wow. I just love hearing birth stories. And I love that everyone is so different. And you know what? You reminded me of something when you were um, – when you were talking about sort of where your head was at and how you had these births where you were like, you know, those ecstatic births that you had Mm -hmm. and you're, you know, which was different than this birth. Right. And, um, 
And I remembered that thinking when I listened back to my birth with Esme, I was so focused when I was telling the story on the podcast, I was so focused on telling the story of grief that happened that I forgot something entirely um, from the birth story. And you just reminded me, which is that um, during the labor process, when I was sitting there with Eric, like, and he, and I thought about this after you know, when we were like listening to it and putting up videos and stuff from that birth. But I kept focusing on the word joy. And I never said that Mm. on the podcast, but I was focusing on the word joy. And I was just calling that in. So like with every contraction, I was like, yes, you know, and I was just like, ah, and I wanted it to feel so good and so positive because of everything that we'd gone through. And so I was like holding on to Eric and like, just being like, wow, you know, and um, it is so different when you put yourself into that mindset and mm-hmm. it, you you really can't. And then there's other births where you just it, that's that's not what my birth was with winter at all. And it's mm-hmm. like I was trying at the beginning to do that. And my body was <laughs> like, uh, no, I need your legs to be super far apart. Uh, it's COVID. <laughs> Things are going to go crazy. You just screwed it all up by getting into the hot shower. Like it was just I wanted that same ecstatic like, wow, birth, you know, where I'm holding my partner and he's like such a champion for me. And of course, Eric was such a champion in the winter birth and he was like so right there for me. But my mindset was totally different. My body was going crazy, you know, so. And I think also I realized sleep is so huge for me. So the forest forest birth, I had had such a great night's sleep the night before and like went into labor in the morning and had him by 12 o'clock. And then with Poet, I went into labor around 7 p.m. and she was born at 11.30 and then I got to go straight back to sleep. And I had had two full nights, really restful sleep the night before both of those births. But then the Bodhi and Prairie births, I did not sleep for two nights in a row. And it was really physically, (laughs) physically took such a toll on me. Yes. Um, Yeah. But I still, it's funny, I still loved the birth. I loved the people who were around me, the experience. I felt so proud of myself that I got through that because I had so many limiting beliefs. There were so many moments where I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Can I do this? Um, And then I would just have to keep reframing, reframe, reframe. And then it got to that really beautiful ecstatic place. When the kids woke up and I fed off that energy, it was so beautiful. And um, before we wrap up, I just want to say anyone considering a home birth, I loved the experience so much. And I think I really set myself up for success with the birth because I was so over the top prepared with my little birth kit and there were so many things, so many things I had. I I mean, random practical things like so many different towels that you don't care if you throw them out afterwards, like cheap black. I chose black. I had like a stack of cheap as chips black towels. I had tarps. I had um, little candles, battery operated candles. I got some fairy lights that I wrapped around the birth tub. Um, and then I had an entire setup with like affirmations and sprays. And I had flannels, which you call washcloths in America. Um, (laughs) I had them all set up and ready. I had my coconut waters out. I had everything laid out, ready to go so that when it was Mm. go time, It was just all the tools were there and then my support people could just grab the tools and help me. So that was really imperative. Yeah, I I totally hear that. And I had um I had something really cool that my midwife had told me about. So in my first birth, which which was a home birth, she said, um, make the bed and put like a like a like a waterproof um cover over uh, the bed first, right? And then make the bed with like sheets and then put another cover over it and then put another set of sheets so that when you're done birthing, no matter what happens, we can rip that off and then it's already ready to go under mm. there for you. And oh. so I was like, oh, that's so genius. Like, 
I didn't have to worry about um, someone remaking the bed and standing up and all that stuff when everything was happening like afterwards. Yeah. Um, so that was amazing. I ran out of Wee Pads, so I should have had many more packages because we were using so news- many. Remember that? We were using yes. newspaper and like anything that oh, we could I find. I have so, so many pee pads. That's another great yeah, one. Yeah, pads. I needed more of those. <laughs> yes, pee pads. Um, the other thing that some people don't know about a home birth is – they try and make it feel like you're at the hospital. So you have oxygen yes. there. There is oxygen set off to the side that comes right. like a day or two before. Um, right. And then they have all the drugs in the fridge that they have you put in the fridge and it's drugs like to stop bleeding. It's Pitocin. They have right. certain Pitocin. things that they need yeah. in case anything goes awry. They have the whole resuscitation equipment and I did feel really safe in Julie's hands and extra safe knowing that that stuff was right there, but also that I was such yes. a close drive to the hospital. For me, I think yeah. if I had tried to do like a free birth on my property, that wouldn't have felt like a safe environment for me. For some women, right. it's amazing. I just heard about a free birth with twins in Byron Bay um, and it was wild. And the second baby was a breech baby. But for that mother, she was like, that's how I wanted to birth. That's how I felt safest. Whoa. So every woman has their own and you can deep deep dive into like how you feel, what's your instinct, what's calling you. But for anyone who are who have been thinking about a home birth or intrigued by it, I say like read up on it, um, get informed. We always say informed birth. And uh, I had such a beautifully positive experience. Yeah, I love it. That's so beautiful. And I love that a lot of the doulas that I've talked to before always say you just should birth where you feel the most comfortable. If it feels the most comfortable for you to be in a hospital or a birthing center or in an Airbnb with a midwife, <laughs> then oh, whatever, whatever the case may be. <laughs> um, but I just, I think that that is amazing and that you got to have that experience and that you have so many different experiences um, mm. that is really inspiring. And oh. thank you so much for sharing that. And you guys, thank you. thank you for joining us for fourth birth story with the beautiful and amazing Prairie Moon. You've been listening to the Mother Days podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye, Daisies. Bye. Bye.